Hello, I'm Beth Franklin, a front end developer here with Crit Health. We want to thank everyone for joining our pandemic burnout, caring for the cancer care professionals session. I'd like to remind everyone that this session is meant to be informational and any medical decisions should be made with your healthcare team. Please be respectful of everyone's lived experiences Inappropriate behavior will not be tolerated and you will be asked to leave. Closed captions are available. If you have um, any questions for the speakers, feel free to enter them into the chat or the Q&A section. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the transcript now. So you should see that pop up. Um, and then um, speaking of the chat, we do encourage participants to participate in the conversation via chat. So with that being said, please go ahead and put in the chat where you're joining us from so that we can see where everybody is coming from. All right, I see Kevin's coming from Pittsburgh, we've got Allie in Rochester. So we've got some New York people call, coming in here. That's where I'm at right now. We've got Arlington, NYC, all right. Okay, so we're so happy to have you guys here. Thank you again for joining. I'm now going to turn it over to our wonderful speakers, Kelly and Valerie. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Valerie Lucas, and I am so honored to be here today presenting with alongside Kelly Henders Hendershot. I am a, a registered nurse, and I began my career at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 2015 after graduating from the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania. I am really excited to share uh, an initiative that I proposed and implemented at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City with all of you, um, and to be able to share my journey within the my, my burnout journey within COVID and how I have been able to find resilience and joy and um, re-engage with the, my passion for nursing and um, to be able to communicate with all of you. So I really encourage everybody to communicate in the chat with any questions throughout my, my session and try to make this as informal as possible. Right, and I'm Kelly Hendershot. I'm the Vice President of um, Partner Relations at the Cancer Support Community. I'm really excited to be uh, co-presenting with Valerie today. I've actually read um, this, uh, the study and the research that she is going to be talking about later, and so it's nice to finally get a chance to meet her. Um, my role with Cancer Support Community is to serve as a liaison between our 175 plus global locations and our headquarters staff. Um, we are, you might know us as guildless clubs, you might know us as cancer support communities, either way, we are the same big happy family. So as a little bit about me personally, I was a caregiver for my husband who was diagnosed in 2007 with the terminal brain cancer. In 2009, after his death, I shifted careers to become a social worker and work in the oncology field. So I've worked at um, Gildas Club Quad Cities in Davenport, Iowa, and now I'm part of the headquarters team. But I speak more from a lens of a licensed mental health professional. I apologize if you hear those sirens going by me. It's, it's a little hot and stuffy in Virginia, so windows are open and I live near a fire station. Um, but there's always something going on, right, in our caregiving lives, so that's just part of it. But for about um, 30 minutes or so, you're going to hear from me, and I'm going to be speaking um, just about some general practical tips to help cope with uh, the social emotional challenges of being professional caregivers to somebody with a cancer diagnosis, including how to balance that care for others with their own self care. We'll also discuss some self care strategies like mindfulness and how to focus on values. So again, I'll be speaking from a licensed mental health pr professionals perspective, and then we'll be hearing from Valerie to speak from um, the lens of a frontline nurse who worked during the pandemic. There we go. So I wouldn't be doing a good job with this presentation. We didn't just take a few minutes to push pause 
And I want us to all just take a few moments, a uh, minute or so, to think about a specific time when you were caregiving, either in your professional or personal lives during the pandemic or otherwise. And just think about how, um, you know, how difficult it was to manage everything going around you. So I'm just going to give you a moment here to think about that. And now let's just imagine that instead of our actual reactions, we decided to push pause. So stillness is something that can allow us to gain clarity and manage our thoughts, feelings, behaviors before we react. And that push pause can be as simple as taking a deep breath or a series of deep breaths. It could always have, um, we like to stay hydrated. You can't see I'm holding my mug. It blends into my background, but taking a quick pause by taking a sip of water, tea, caffeine, to just re take a moment before we react to things. Um, and that can be really challenging in our professional lives, especially when caring for cancer patients. And we'll talk about some additional tips for pushing pause in the moments when we need it most. So just a brief overview about what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about some common worries and concerns, benefits of caregiving, because I think it's always important to go back to why are we in caring professions? We'll talk about our emotional well being how to push pause, and then we'll turn things over to Valerie for, Valerie for her experience. Um, and I just want to share too briefly um, that there's a lot of reports that connect burnout um, by professional caregivers um, that have been coming out recently, and it just really reiterates the topic and the importance for us to be having this conversation today. One of those studies that I reported while um, some of these common worries are coming up on the screen is there was a report published just earlier this month on the 20th by Definitive Healthcare, and it said that an estimated 333,942 healthcare professionals, pr um, providers dropped out of the workforce in 2021, many of whom departed due to retirement, but also burnout and other stressors related to the pandemic, according to this new data. Um, as a profession, physicians lost the most members with over 117,000 individuals leaving their roles last year. That's followed by nursing, nurse practitioners, um, which lost 53,295 members, and physician assistants with 200, or, I'm sorry, 22,704 um, physicians that were vacated. And a lot of the stated reasons for these change in positions were working on sustainable hours, fear of infection from COVID, the emotional toll from having lost colleagues and patients, not only to um, cancer, but to COVID, and then being less satisfied in their roles because they weren't able to work at the top of their license. People were getting bogged down in um, administrative duties and things like that. So I'm just curious right now before I move forward, and you can share this in the chat and I'll keep talking, but which of these worries resonate most with you? And I know we've got a variety of people, so I'm also going to ask you to put in the chat right now, if you are a uh, professional <laughs> caregiver, what role you play, doctor, nurse, social work, other position at a health facility, if you are uh, caring for someone in your personal life, please let us know that as well. So feel free to keep that chat active as we speak. So here on the screen now, you see a lot of different um, practical, physical, and emotional roles that caregivers play. Um, and I try to cater these more towards the professional caregivers. So working with your patients and the healthcare team to make sure that there's clear communication, that coordination of care, patient safety, Offering emotional support, even if it's not officially your job, that I know well from being in and out of hospital situations with family members that any professional, doctor, nurse, social worker, even administrative staff provides some level of emotional support to your patients, providing companionship, and then those navigation needs. And it, some of these got really tough during the pandemic too. Finding transportation, um, finding home aids when people are afraid to go in, into homes and risk infection or risk bringing in infection from COVID. Um, medication fulfillment, financial insurance, and then just other duties. 
So Valerie, I know you're going to be sharing more about your experience a bit later, but could you briefly talk now about the role of uh, an outreach nurse um, and how that role supports your peers in a hospital setting? Absolutely. So uh, the outreach RN role is one that I designed and developed after looking through the literature and uh, found that I really wanted to create another method and another workflow for nurses, patients, and their families. And what this role did was it helped to promote continuity of care when patients needed to be transferred from a non-monitored floor to an escalation of care in a, in a higher level of monitoring, such as a telemetry monitoring or a step-down unit. And that's where I really came in. And once that order went in for them to be transferred out of the current unit they resided on, because Memorial Sloan Kettering doesn't have um, a global telemetry system, we would have to transfer them out. And the feedback that I received from my coworkers and from nurses on other units and from the multidisciplinary team, as well as the patients was just from a place of feeling supported, feeling cared for, that there was somebody who the hospital has appointed to them to be with them from point A all the way through that transition to point B. And when we're looking at the patient's journey, we're really looking at the vulnerabilities that could be presented and, and areas that they could feel have more fear associated with it and have more um, of the unknown be present at that time. And especially when you have a patient, when you yourself know that there's 15 people running in for what is assistance for the patient, but is very alarming for the patient's perspective to be able to tell them at that time that my name is Valerie, I'm going to be here with you throughout this entire journey for when we're taking care of you right now and getting you settled to the next place so that you're safe and that you feel well informed throughout that entire process. And um, patients have been moved to tears throughout those experiences, feeling very well cared for and feeling well informed throughout that journey. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know we'll be hearing much more from you. I've got a few more questions through my presentation as well. Um, uh, right now, what I'm showing on the slide now is uh, just some areas where we might feel resistance as professional caregivers. Um, our patients and their family members, they have, especially with a cancer diagnosis, a uh, great loss of independence. They feel a great loss of control. They might be limited by their um, energy levels, by fatigue, by uh, chemo brain. And then there's a lot of change and uncertainty happening in their lives. And that can really present a resistance in one aspect to caregiving because those are important emotional needs that we need to make sure we're facing. All of these resistance points were greatly exacerbated during the pandemic when patients were alone um, with their healthcare teams. They didn't have their loved ones by their side for additional support. Um, I know in my own husband's cancer um, experience, I, I can't imagine not being in the room for all those appointments with him. But I know I keep jumping into your story a little bit here, Valerie, but I think it's really fitting as well. Um, your publication about your outreach um, RN role, you included a citation that this may decrease the length of hospital stay, enhance communication between staff and patients, improve continuity of care, and facilitate a safe patient transfer to advanced care units. By addressing these needs, how do you feel your role is breaking down some of these resistance points for patients? I think that it's incredibly important to have these things addressed for the resistance points and to be able to mitigate them how we could. So that's exactly what this role was intended to do. And it's um, to be able to re-engage the patient during a very vulnerable transition period in the hospital where they're already feeling the, the sense of being in the hospital. They're already feeling really weak and fatigued and out of place in so many different aspects of their care. So being able to keep them informed and reinstilling them with that independence and being able to provide that to them during those points is, is giving them the power to feel in control 
and giving them the opportunity to be very participant in their care. And we always want to make sure that patients don't feel like that some, everything's happening to them, that they're the priority. They're the most important person in the room that we're all working around them to be able to engage them in their care. So when we're really giving them that voice and allowing them to feel comfortable speaking up and to understand what the next steps are in their process, um, that what this role did was, was helping to identify one person that would be assisting the patient throughout the time when for example, they have a tele telemetry trans telemetry order placed, um, and then from throughout the time frame where they might have to be residing on an unmonitored unit due to hospital census, and sometimes that could take thirty minutes, but other times when the hospital census was high, that could take four hours. Uh, and there's a lot of waiting period, a lot of uncertainty that happens, and that patients are experiencing and feeling, and keeping them up to date as well as working side by side with their primary nurse to support that nurse and alleviate some of the burden they're feeling from a patient who's now a higher level of care and is, is still under their, under their supervision of what they can do. It helped to alleviate that burden for the nurse as well as be a support and resource for the patients. That's great. Thanks for sharing. And I think, um, you know, I actually even see parallels to your role in what we do at CSC and Gilda's Club's locations, because we're working to make sure that we're helping empowering that patient voice by addressing the psychosocial support needs um, with these resistance areas. So I want to make sure we talk really briefly about why we're in caregiving roles. Um, and again, you can put in the chat what your specific role is, if you're a family caregiver, if you're a professional caregiver. But um, we know that people become caregivers for a variety of reasons. Um, a, these include just desire to care for loved ones. And this is coming um, from a research study on caregivers. Um, the many faces of caregivers, and that's about 63%. And then having close relationship um, to the care recipient is another 58%. Having the time and capacity to do so is 43%. And then living in close proximity to the care recipient factors into 36%. So there's those specific reasons. We feel a sense of pride for what we do. Um, Many of us enjoy our caregiver role, our professional caregiving role. Otherwise, we couldn't, wouldn't keep doing it. Um, and then we're inspired to become advocates as well. So just go ahead and put in the chat a little bit about why you choose either caregiving as a profession or why you're ch choosing to be a caregiver for somebody in your personal life. While those are coming through, I want to transition us to mental health, and we're going to talk a little bit about distress, anxiety, and depression, um, and how to alleviate of these to some extent in our roles. But distress, I'm going to share the definition um, just because I don't know who all we have in the audience, but the definition of distress is extreme anxiety, sorrow, or pain. So typically, um, the vital signs are maybe you have an increase in temperature, your pulse rate increases, you start breathing heavy, you might have some increased blood pressure or even pain. I know I tend to get migraines when I'm distressed. Um, and so there can be a lot of different individualized distress points in your lives too. But sleep issues are a few others, just not feeling like your normal self. So just go ahead and take a look, look at this list and make mental note of something on this that you really feel that you connect with. You can feel free to continue to share in the chat as well. I see the chat's pretty active today, which is always great at the GRIT, grit conferences. But we're going to speak a little bit about anxiety now. So at Cancer Support Community, we have what's called a Cancer Experience Registry. And from our 2020 report, we found that caregivers with anxiety can have physical and emotional symptoms. Emotionally, they might feel tense, worried, wary, agitated, and even distracted. And while this data point is speaking specifically towards family caregivers, I know it resonates with all the professional caregivers on the call too. 
Physically, you might tremble, sweat, or even shake. You might be short of breath, have rapid heart rate, feel like your heart's pounding in your chest. Um, for others, maybe it's more of an upset stomach feeling, headaches, I mentioned my migraines, loss of appetite, nausea, and difficulty sleeping. So anxiety and fear are really common reactions to stressful life events like a cancer diagnosis or like caring for somebody with a cancer diagnosis when you have those different ups and downs, the highs and lows of, is there going to be metastasis? Um, is this a good scan day? Is there any um, change in prognosis for good or bad? But extreme or prolonged anxiety can lead to a more serious anxiety disorder that can affect your ability to participate actively in your loved one's treatments, your patient's treatments, and even your daily work, um, daily home and work activities. We also need to talk a little bit about depression. Um, our report shows that 34% 34, 34 of caregivers reported fatigue and depression levels substantially worse than the national levels. So symptoms of depression can include sleeping too much or not enough, um, lack of interest in your regular activities that you like to enjoy, withdrawing from your friends and from family members, um, some amount of anxiety and depression is really to be expected under the circumstances of either having a personal um, loved one diagnosed with cancer or your patients working with uh, cancer patients day in and out. But extreme prolonged anxiety and depression can, again, affect your ability to participate actively in your patient's treatment, your loved one's treatment, and your daily activities. So... As a good mental health professional, professional, I'm just going to do my quick reminder, contact your healthcare provider um, for a referral to a trained psychologist or a licensed mental health counselor. If you notice that your worry and sadness is getting worse, it's getting in the way of your daily life. Um, and if it lasts most of the day or for uh, a series of weeks in a row. So now that I've covered a little bit of that data, Valerie, can you talk just a little bit more too about how your role can help mitigate some of this burnout caused by distress, anxiety, and depression that um, others on a cancer patient's care team might feel? Absolutely. So uh, I think for inpatient settings, uh, many of the typical way, ways that we address when there's a critical situation is through a rapid response. And we know that when a rapid response is called for a patient, it is a very alarming experience for the patient and it can be very overwhelming for a nurse. Um, and for the role that I created, its purpose was to be able to inter intersect into patient care before there was a need for a rapid response to be called. And for that reason, when I developed the role itself, I really mirrored it from how the rapid response nurse was functioning in a way that was completely a support for that primary nurse and was able to walk them through things. I, in the inpatient setting, there is um, a lot of knowledge there that we have nurses who have only been in the workforce for less than five years. And because of that, there's a lot of uncertainty doing certain, doing specific nursing tasks where they don't feel entirely confident um, engaging in certain conversations. So I, I use this role as a form of providing that really one-on-one -on -one support for the nurse. So they feel like they were supported along with from their charge nurse and from their other resources on the unit. It was another person who was there with them to be able to guide them through this, um, this patient's journey and um, an, an escalation of care. So there was a lot that would be entailed in that and even just what, for a transfer process for a stable patient. So when the patient's not stable, their blood pressure is dropping, they need to be hooked up to a monitor, they need the oxygen tanks, doing all of those tasks at once, um, along with managing the rest of your patient assignment is very easily overwhelming. Uh, so what this role provided is, is that individual person who was able to do those things, provide this care and be a full assist for that nurse. And, um, and allow for the patient to feel 
well received and that one person was designated to, to be able to respond to them in this way as well. Um, nurses felt incredibly supported for what this role was providing. If I have another minute, um, Kelly, I'd just like to read actually one comment sure. from um, a nurse. So I had conducted a survey that I asked all uh, nurses to complete following the um, patient, following the interaction with the outreach RN role. So specifically, and it was um, this, this um, anecdote is taken word for word um, to preserve the integrity of what the nurse had said. So it, it states the outreach RN was a welcomed resource during my teletransfer. She helped manage the patient's care, communicate it with the LIP, gave medications and assist it with the transfer. She made the transfer seamless as it's difficult at times to pull resources from the floor and alleviate a stressful situation. As the primary RN, I felt confident with her care and hope that it becomes a permanent role. That's a great quote to share. Thank you for that. And can't wait to hear more about your story in a little bit here. All right, let's talk about emotional first aid for a little bit. When you are trying to balance caring for yourself and a loved one with cancer, you're, whether they're uh, someone you know personally or your patients, it's really critical to have some tools to help combat the emotional, physical, and spiritual toll that caregiving um, gives us. That helps us um, push pause a little bit more and take a brief moment um, or two throughout our days. So just some examples here as they pop up on the screen, you know, re relaxation techniques, active coping, reframing our thoughts. Um, and these relaxation techniques, they can be brief. They can be five minutes of, of just sipping coffee to yourself in the morning. It doesn't have to be actual meditation, although meditation is great. You can start your day by prioritizing your tasks, reframe your thoughts. Um, it does not mean that we have to reframe something um, to be positive. But what we want to do is really neutralize a thought to help us alleviate some of the increased feelings of distress. Um, for example, would it change? What if this treatment doesn't work for my patient to, while we're not um, positive that it will be have 100% outcomes that we're hoping for, we're doing everything we can to allow for the treatment course um, to keep us on schedule with quality of life, keep us on top of things like our appointments and keep us working with the full oncology team. Um, maximizing our social support, making sure that you're calling close friends, family members, um, clergy, if that is important to you, joining support groups, there are support groups for professionals as well, um, or even peer mentor opportunities to really enhance that mental support. I know I've got my go-to social workers that I call on when I'm having really um, kind of those harder, more, more emotional days. Try mindfulness, you know, and sometimes just change your scenery, walk into another room, step outside um, when you notice some of these more overwhelming thoughts coming up. And that just helps you recenter yourself and pause. All right, so let's review a little bit. You know um, what the most important th guiding value is for yourself, and it's different for everybody. So please don't compare yourself to others when we're talking about how we, how we do our own self-care. You might get ideas from other people, but um, not everything works for everybody. But a simple goal of incorporating at least five minutes of self-care a day, that could be uh, 30 minutes, three times a week, just a short walk, just stepping outside. Once you start creating that list, you'll have a good list of pleasurable activities to choose from. And just pick one. If it helps, great. Keep doing it. Do it again. If it doesn't help, you have a list. Go back to that list and try something else. The next step is make sure that we're setting an intention and keeping it simple with these list of activities. So what did you used to like to do? Is it something that you can bring back into your life? Um, for example, I really enjoyed reading, always have my entire life. So can I just set aside just a few minutes to get through a chapter a day? Um, do I need to do it differently? Um, you know, maybe it's not even a chapter a day reading it. Maybe I switch to audiobooks because that's more easily to incorporate that way of escape into my life at this time. 
what things might get in the way of this intention. Um, you know, I, I could have forgot my book at home. I could have forgot my headphones. There's a lot of different things, especially if you're relying on technology. But then I just go home and make sure that I take care of it later. It doesn't have to happen at the same time every day, whatever that activity is. And then how do you overcome those obstacles I just shared? You can always pause, if there's that word pause again, and do it a little bit later. But make a plan for yourself. You know, is there a good time of day for you to do whatever activity is important to you? Um, I know some people love to get up early before they go to the office, um, before they go to the hospital, do their meditation, do some yoga, do some mindfulness. I'm the opposite. I like to do all that after a long day at work. It really helps me de-stress and calm before bed. So again, even the time of day you're doing these things doesn't have to be what everybody else is doing. You have to just make it work with your schedule. We've got a couple of Ds we're going to talk about. So there are depleters and derailers that can get in the way of the best of intentions. So things like multitasking, what are you doing during this conference? You know, are you checking email? Are you engaged with your speakers? Are you communicating in the chat and um, tuning out the rest of the outside world? Negative people, negative thoughts, negative situations, um, competing demands, these all lead to caregiver burnout. So when we use up all of our energy without refilling our tank, it really leaves us feeling empty or depleted. So start sharing in the chat, but how have you coped with feelings of worry in the past? Um, you know, it's important that we think about what's been successful before and acknowledge that because we can learn from these skills from previous stressor and continue to apply them in our lives. So in summary, make those plans for the future. And again, they can be simple. I'm not talking about taking two weeks of vacation off. I'm talking about immediate things that you can do through your day. Take a break, go outside, enjoy fresh air, sneak in five minutes of a good book or a good um, podcast. What is important to you and make changes that are important um, for you and your loved ones to be able to enjoy those things. Maybe it's starting something new. Maybe um, your old routine isn't working and you feel like you're in a rut and uh, you can adapt a new hobby. But just keep moving ahead one step at a time. It's okay if you get derailed, just get back on track and moving forward. But then set some goals and or priorities. Is it spending more time with friends and family? And just focus, whatever that goal is, focus on what really matters to you, not what you're being told should matter. It could be completing a project around the house, maybe scrapbooking. Um, individualize it though. Again, I can't stress enough. It has to be something that's going to work for you. And then reach out to people in your lives, trusted friends, family, clergy, mental health professionals. Um, if you are caring for somebody with a cancer diagnosis and are not a professional caregiver, make sure you're talking to the oncologist or your oncology team about the concerns that you or your loved one are having. Um, some fears and concerns may be unfounded and can be cleared up just through a better understanding of the treatment plan for your loved one. Sometimes we're worried about things that we don't need to be worried about. We just need to voice them so that others can help ease that concern. And real briefly, I'm gonna talk about some important resources that we have for you, whether you're caring for somebody in your personal life or you are a professional caregiver. We have our Cancer Support Healthline. It is staffed by community navigators and research specialists who are available to assist you from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time, Saturdays, nine to five Eastern time, and we have translation available in 200 languages. And whether you're a patient, family member, friend, healthcare professional, we offer a variety of professionally led programs designed to assist you. So we, again, I mentioned earlier, have over 175 locations worldwide on our website, which is included in the link here. You can find a location nearest you. I saw somebody in the chat is a, a participant in our Gildas Club Kentuckiana location in Louisville. But we provide something for every age group and life situation, including children's and teens, families affected by cancer. 
And best of all, all these programs are offered at no cost to anyone impacted by a cancer diagnosis, including the healthcare professionals. So check out our list of locations and um, see if there's one near you. Otherwise, there's always that helpline. We have My Lifeline, which is an online platform. It has features like a helping calendar, personal blogs, discussion boards, including one for caregivers. Um, so I, I really encourage all of you to take a look at My Lifeline to get connected to other people. I've, I've shared some data from our cancer experience registry. This is a survey that covers emotional, physical, practical, and financial impact of cancer so that patients and caregivers can receive the support they need. So by taking the survey, you join thousands of others in helping to influence healthcare policies, enhance healthcare, and improve support services. Finally, one last one I want to mention is Frankly Speaking About Cancer. It's our award-winning educational series from Cancer Support Community and Gilda's Clubs. It covers topics ranging from um, caring for a loved one, how to talk with your family about cancer, clinical trials, and what to do for somebody who's newly diagnosed. So I am going to skip past this Q&A slide, actually, and turn things over to Valerie to share a bit more of her story. Thank you, Kelly. That was incredible and so, so helpful, so beneficial. Um, everything you said really resonated with me, and um, I can see from the chat that everyone agrees as well. So thank you for that. Um, so regarding my uh, the role, which was the Outreach RN, my publication, for those who are interested to see a little bit more of the specifics about the role, is called the Outreach RN, a nurse-led initiative to improve transitions in care for critically ill patients with cancer. And this article could be found in the Clinical Journal of Oncology Nursing. Um, when I first uh, went to MSK, I was a new grad nurse and I was very optimistic and felt incredibly welcomed and loved by the MSK community and a place where I really call home at, at this point. And I feel very honored to work there. Um, I was able to see in my workflow, working in the step down unit and thoracic surgery unit, um, that patients who were transferred to our level of care often came from non-monitored units. And because we don't have the central telemetry, uh, that there was a, a, a gap for patients. And I worked um, with my manager and did an evidence-based project to pilot this role and received incredible feedback for a three-month pilot and then transitioned it into a full-time um, position in early 2020. So just some individual roles and responsibilities for the outreach RN are that we would respond to an escalation of care for newly upgraded telemetry or step-down unit patients. We would provide dysrhythmia interpretations for critical care level and critical care level skills. We were proactively rounding on units and collaborating with the rapid response nurse to provide additional relief. And we aided in patient safety by further preventing patient decompensation. And finally, we were safely coordinating the journey for patients and ensured the continuity of care in, in the transit. Um, so it's needless to say that this, this project became a baby to me. And I was going into work every day. I was stay, going in early, staying late. This project was not something that was needed for school. I wasn't in school at the time. I didn't need it for, for anything other than the fact that I felt so alive and, and passionate about the work I was doing and, and saw the difference from the care that I was able to assist with from the patient's perspective and what they were verbally sharing with me and from the nurse's perspective who were the primary nurses for patients who were upgraded in their level of care and I went to assist with them. Um, I sent a Likert style survey to all of them and I, um, of the hundred nurses who received the survey during the time frame of the pilot, 89% um, of them strongly agreed that the outreach RN was knowledgeable and was an asset during events for, such as escalation of care and patient transfers. And 80% of them strongly agreed that the outreach RN facilitated a safe patient transfer and that they felt really supported from the presence of the outreach RN. And uh, additionally, 72% of nurses strongly agreed that the communication improved 
during patient events when the outreach RN was there as well. So it, um, it was a very unique experience to even have that possibility to develop the role and then transition it after I wrote a budget proposal for a full-time position where I trained 15 nurses to rotate day and night and be out of the numbers on our unit and just fully functioning in this capacity. Um, and then the pandemic hit and um, my unit transitioned from a step down, medical surgical step down unit to a COVID ICU um, overflow. And I had been onboarded within a matter of hours to take care of these critically ill patients and the level of uncertainty that was going on in the world at the time and the, the fear and um, just so much anxiety surrounding what was happening in the hospital, but in everybody's personal life as well, was very overwhelming. I remember specifically the first patient's uh, room that I ever walked into because I felt I was writing lists of everything I needed to do in that room and it included just checking their vital signs. I mean, the patient was mechanically ventilated, orally intubated, paralyzed, sedated on three pressers and all of those things I had just learned how to really manage um, pretty, pretty quickly. And I felt when I walked into the room really paralyzed with fear because I, it was just a very overwhelming sense altogether. Um, and I remember really coordinating with the family since families weren't able to be with the patients at the time to, to be in the room with, the, with, with my phone and with them on the phone. And they passed around their phone within the family and everyone said goodbye to their loved one. And their loved one wasn't wasn't able to be engaging with them because they were intubated and sedated. And it was something that I very much absorbed as the, as the caregiver at that time and as the nurse. And then I felt myself in the room and tears were coming down my face. And I realized that I was so afraid that my seal was then breaking from my N95, um, that the whole process of that was just incredibly overwhelming to really take, had, had, take the bulls by the horn and to be moving forward with it. Um, and needless to say, the outreach RN role that I cared so deeply about was, was no longer in existence. And we had all hands on deck for, for really what took priority for these COVID patients. Um, when we use these wartime terms and terminologies, um, it was very accurate and that's how it felt. Um, so as we continued to manage COVID patients from you know, that initial few months in the spring and then realize that this is not going away like we expected, that we're in here for the long haul. And then we go, okay, well, maybe we'll be good by the, the September. Maybe we'll be good by the winter. And um, to continue to feel the level of guilt that I wasn't able to provide the patients the same level of care that I had initially prior to COVID. And I wasn't spending as much time in the room with them. And I, I, had a, I had a patient who had a chest tube and patients don't shower with chest tubes. They never have. And you would know if they were even moving around in their room, um, getting ready for a shower. And I walked in one day and the patient's hair was wet who had the chest tube. I said, oh my gosh, you tumbled your head in the sink and you got ready and you got your, you got your shower. That's so impressive. Or uh, you just wash your hair in the sink. And I said, that's amazing. Do you feel better? She said, I, I didn't do this in the sink. I've been taking a shower every day. This is my third shower since I've been here. And I was like, just in disbelief that this was a whole separation for the patients being so isolated. And from a nursing perspective, not being able to be there supporting my patient to the same level of care and degree that would usually be there. And when things would go wrong, I really personally took them as some, as a, as a form of tremendous guilt that I took on as um, a flaw in not being able to be there for them. And that sense of burnout and worthlessness very much started setting in and, and it creeped in for a while. And then um, all of a sudden it really came on very fast where I didn't recognize the person who I was um, because I was just very angry with 
I don't know with the situation. There was, there's not one person, everybody was doing everything they could and everybody was contributing. And every time somebody donated food, I wish I could thank every one of those people because it got us through that shift. But at the end of the day, we weren't able to feel the same joy and passion that we always had known was embedded in the work we did. And having that removed um, because we were trying to maintain a level of safety for ourselves, not expose other people, um, limit the care we were providing by clustering it, but also knowing that things were inevitably being missed was a devastating realization. And, and it took a very significant toll on me. Um, I internalized all of that and I was really a shell of myself to the point where um, I would go out and try to do those things that would sustain you typically. And I would be out with, with friends and an outside setting and where it felt socially distanced and safe. And I would just be crying the whole time. And even if I was trying to find meaning and joy in other ways, it felt so far and so distant. I felt like I couldn't even touch it. I don't, I didn't even remember that. And uh, a close friend of mine had had presented on a project that she was doing during the time of COVID. And um, we were in the nursing station all together and she was very excited about bringing forth this, this initiative and um, really eager to share it with everybody. And her presentation was excellent. And I remember at the end of it, I sitting through it was really challenging for me. At the end of it, I stood up and I had to just walk out and walk right into my manager's office. And I absolutely burst into tears because I remember what it felt like what as the same my colleague was presenting, I remember that excitement and that vigor and the enthusiasm. And I couldn't recognize myself in that moment of how I got from where I was and how I got to where I am today um, or where I was at that point. And it was uh, a turning point to for me to recognize that I needed to be able to take a step back and to, to take care of myself because there was no way I would be able to provide the level of care I have expected myself and that I know I was capable of while I was in a state where I was not able to function at that, at that capacity. Um, and I had been looking for sources of, of assistance from my primary care doctor to what my institution offered and, and looking in every way to have to find a therapist even, to just see who can help me. And the barriers that I hit every turn were so disheartening that I felt as an educated nurse who works in the field, and I am going from January of 2021 until March of 2021, actively seeking somebody to find to work with me and, uh, and being unable to find that was also very disheartening and also adding to this trauma and this isolation. Um, and it wasn't until I was um, shown this uh, 501c3 pro emotional PPE project, uh, which if um, we can have our moderator writing that in the chat for sending the, uh, the group the link, that would be wonderful because this individual project was everything for me. It was a turning point where I recognized it was not, I wasn't feeling so guilty for taking the time off and that I really needed this time to heal for myself. So I ultimately decided to take two months off from work and it was an incredibly challenging um, decision to make because I acknowledged that while I was gone, my coworkers who were still in the thick of it were showing up for work every day. And I had a lot of negative self-talk during those times. So it would be, a, it was a challenge to be able to be even comfortable in my own space and in the own isolation of my apartment while I knew what everybody else was doing. Um, but through the work that I did with um, Emotional PPE Project, I began to, to heal and overcome this journey of, of severe burnout so that I didn't leave the profession altogether so that I didn't leave something that I've truly always loved and feel so called to do and to show up for my patients. And I find such great meaning and joy um, with them every day. And I walk away, you know, 
understanding how grateful I am to even be in this position to care for them um, was, was something that took time for me to, to heal from and recognize within myself. And I was listening to podcasts all day long because it would help me not feel so alone. Um, I was channeling into two of my favorite um, people who work in uh, an atmosphere of vulnerability and um, and promoting joy and how to find happiness. And that's Brene Brown and, and Cleo Wade. And one day I sat down, I took a bath and I took a post-it note and I wrote all my favorite quotes from Cleo Wade's book, Heart Talk. And I had them all over my whole bathroom. And I just was looking at all of my favorite quotes in my bathroom, trying to reinstill and um, that meaning for me and, and find that purpose again. And um, I set and I started setting an alarm, um, a gratitude alarm, because I realized that I had lost that part of myself throughout throughout COVID and throughout the burnout. That I had to be very intentional to to recognize by that um, I wanted to give gratitude towards so many of the great things that were still happening every day for me, and the love that I was feeling, and the support that I felt from every colleague and from my manager. Um, to be able to heal and, and come back from, from the place that I was in. And I'm just incredibly grateful for that. So all of the little things, they seem, they seem like they're, they might be another task or chore throughout the day, but it's really taking that muscle memory to, um, to get you and to persevere through these really challenging times. And all of the suggestions that Kelly, Kelly provided and the resources she provided is, are emotion are amazing because they do make such a big difference. And it's important to tap into those resources and to reach out for help. And at a time when I didn't recognize it in myself, I had the support of the people around me who helped me understand it and feel okay with that decision to, to leave and to know that I was very loved by all of them and then um, come back even, even stronger. Um, so I, um, would recommend for everybody to be very gentle with themselves if they feel like they're on this journey that um, I recently heard that everything is that we're always going through ebbs and flows and that the moon goes through ebbs and flows the ocean goes through ebbs and flows and that it's just a part of the cycle of life that you know we as caregivers also go through them and to um, continue doing those things every day that help to fill your cup and, and to not let it get uh, too far that it's too challenging to, to really recognize that in yourself, to reach out before that point because um, it does make all the difference. So I welcome any questions that anyone has um, about my, my discussion and I would open up anything in the chat uh, at this time. I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. First of all, thank you. I love the idea of a gratitude alarm. And I just want to ask, because I think it's going to be really important for everybody here to um, hear this. Once you made that brave decision to kind of push pause and focus on yourself, I know immediately it was hard to adjust to, but did you feel different physically once you started doing that? Did you feel um, more energetic when you did return to work? Can you talk just a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, of course. So immediately when I, when I took the break, actually, um, I had worked, um, worked it out to be able to have one month off. And so I didn't, um, I knew I had 30 days, but as every one day passed, I would be so crippled with fear. Um, and, and really being like a, somebody that I did not recognize with having to go back in 28 days and having to go back in 27 days. And it actually took away from my ability to process and to heal and to recover because I was hyper-focused on going back. So that is completely negating what the whole purpose was for me. Um, and then when I, when I came to accept that space that I was in and to really lean into it and, and do some hard work and do a lot of reflection and do a lot of journaling um, that I'm really grateful to have had that time because it wouldn't have happened without it. And it was very much a place of self-discovery for me in so many ways. Um, so that when I came back to work, the anxiety was still there, but it was an anxiety that was manageable at that point. It was a, it was a, 
recognizable fear of being away from something, but not so that it was incapacitating and that I um, was so welcomed back by everybody. And even though I still felt a little um, nervous really going back, the the way that I was greeted and returned to work and that muscle memory again kicks in. It's like riding a bike, you go back to work and you get in your workflow and it feels good. And I'm so grateful to be able to be at a point now where I, I recognize all of those joys and those passions and those little moments that I'm able to spend with patients and the, the great reward that I have every day of being a nurse is very present in, in my work life. So I'm just incredibly grateful for having you know, going through the whole journey, it made me a lot stronger and more aware of myself. Um, and hopefully this could be something that others connect to. I'm always happy to talk about it with anybody because I, I think there's a little bit of a taboo surrounding this topic. Um, even when I was sharing everything with my, with my mom, who I'm incredibly close with, um, she'll get on the phone with me at the end of the end of the day. And this Two months ago, we were chatting. I said, oh, mom, I have an appointment. I'm going to go talk to my therapist after this. And she said, two of us are on the phone and whispered to me. And she said, you're still seeing a therapist. And I said, yes, I am. And I love her and I'm grateful for her. So um, to really break down that barrier of having any stigma and having any resistance to asking for help, because um, we would any friend, any loved one wants you to be able to have that. So we should give that same love and, and friendship to ourselves. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I'm, t- I'm jumping in for you, Beth, but I just thought uh, Valerie did such a great job. Are, have we had any more questions come in though for either of us? Um, we've just had a few people mention in the chat how much they have enjoyed this session, which is kind of why I took a bit of a pause. <laughs> Because of the fact that I was just kind of soaking in um, your experiences and um, like the tips that you gave Kelly on how to handle the things that we're going through and um, Valerie just trying to appreciate your experiences and um, trying to keep that in mind for the nurses that I have in my life and things like that. Um, And so we just want to really, really thank you two for doing this session. I mean, wow, what, what a powerful session. I'm pretty sure that anybody who's been on here can agree with me that we are very grateful for having you here and for being so real and so authentic. Um, And do you guys, do you have any um, closing remarks um, before I do a little bit of housekeeping? Just a reminder, I think people don't practice self-care because they get this idea in their head that it has to be something big, something expensive, even something time consuming. And that's not it at all. It's just, you know, I said push pause several times. Beth, you said that you took a moment to pause. Valerie took time off to pause. It's it's pausing. It doesn't have to be anything time consuming. Valerie, do you have um, anything else to add? Um, I I just have one thing. It's a little funny story. I was looking for those cheap, not cheap, but those ways to just feel reinvigorated too. And I went to the dollar store and I got all um, of this laminated paper that would function as a faux wallpaper. And I did my whole bathroom wall one day. I was doing a lot in the bathroom during COVID in this time. I did my, I decorated my whole bathroom and I asked people to walk in there now. And I must, I got five rolls. So it was $5 and 75 cents for everything. And I asked people to walk in and ask and how much I spent, how much time I spent and how expensive they think the wallpaper looked. And everyone's like, I don't know. Was it like $500? Like, was it more? And I was like, no, this is some part of my self-care journey during COVID and when I felt very burnt out. And every time I walk in there, it makes me smile and it and it reminds me of of the fight and the journey to be able to find yourself again. Um, so like you said, it doesn't have to be anything expensive. You can go to the dollar store and get fake wallpaper and put it on your bathroom walls. It doesn't matter what it is, all that it's meaningful for you. Well, that, I mean, I feel like that really does sum it up. That's just 
beautiful. <laughs> um, so we want to thank all of our participants for joining us and for participating in the chat and um, keeping this going. And um, our next session is Centering the Patient Voice, the Future of Cancer Research. And we hope that you're able to join us for that as well. Um, yeah, thank you again so much to our speakers for um, doing this session. Thank you to the participants for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.